All right, so this is gonna be a random off topic thing of trying to fix this air compressor. Uh, so I just inherited this thing, otherwise I probably wouldn't be messing with it. And uh, originally was told that they thought the compressor had seized up, but the compressor's fine. The problem it has is uh, it's supposed to be one of these deals where it can run on 110 or 220. And it had the 110 plug for it uh, originally on the end of it, and then it had an adapter to hook it up to 220. But I didn't grab that whenever I picked it up because I didn't know what it went to, and I didn't think that it went to this. So, but if you plugged it into a 110 outlet and flipped it on, it immediately just popped the GFCI and wouldn't even try and turn the motor over. And so I wired it up to the 220 because I figured that maybe it was something with the 110 side was wasn't enough i know i don't know but i hooked it up to the 220 plugged that in flipped it on and it ran for probably two or three seconds but it sounded like it was just under a whole lot of load which i mean it spins free it really wasn't but it just sounded like it was laboring really hard and then it blew the uh breaker for the building so, uh, an air compressor that doesn't work isn't worth having. So I'm going to give this one attempt to get this thing to work. And if it doesn't work, then I might just try putting a different motor and uh, air compressor head on it. Uh, based on what I read online, I'm using a ohm meter set on the, this one just automatically, I guess, just sets on whatever is the most appropriate metric so it's on just the highest settings of ohms it can go on and so what apparently happens is whenever you have one of these digital meters on the real high ohm setting like mega ohms or kilo ohms or what have you it actually runs a little bit of current through the leads and so it tries so what it'll do is it'll charge up the capacitor and what a capacitor does when you the more charge you put in a capacitor the higher the resistance gets up until the point that it discharges. So whenever a capacitor is at its max charge, then it's uh, it's pretty much like an open circuit. It, it doesn't let any amperage flow through it. And then when it discharges, it's like uh, just direct contact touching the leads. So what we should see on the meter here is put the leads on and it should start building up resistance because if it's holding charge, then it's gonna build up resistance up until the point that it discharges and it'll drop down to zero and then start over again. So we're gonna see if it does that here. Oh, and just a tidbit, uh, before I even unplugged this uh, capacitor, I tapped across it with the screwdriver like that across both terminals to discharge it, which it didn't spark or anything just because it had been sitting for so long that it definitely didn't have a charge in it. But capacitors, like batteries, can hold a charge, so you want to make sure you discharge it before you mess with it. Put the terminal on there, and nothing is happening. So this capacitor is, it built up pretty much an immeasurable amount of charge there, resulting in 11.1 .1 ohms of resistance. Uh, but that is definitely not good. But let's just verify that our test is actually working. And hook it up to this other one here. Okay, so there you go. See, so we're building up charge and resistance. And there it goes. So it just it just dumped all its energy, and now we're starting over again. I'll let it do it one more time. So this is a good capacitor because it's showing that it's building up to its well. I don't know exactly what farads it's building up to because that's a really hard thing to figure out apparently. But point is, it's working a damn sight better than that one. So this guy is probably our problem, and I'm going to pull off the other one just to verify it, and then we'll go see about ordering parts. All right, I got the other capacitor out, and 
the brands don't match for whatever reason, so I have no idea if this thing's already been worked on or if that's just how it came. But I discharged it before I took it out, just to tap on it again, just to make sure. Does this have two dead capacitors? Is that how this is working? Okay, well this guy seems to be working more, so we'll just go with it. We got the new capacitor in. Uh, there is the part number and such for anybody who cares. I don't know, any more, if anybody actually wants any information on it, just, I guess, ask it below and I'll do my best to answer it. Oh, I got my safety glasses on. Um, that'd probably insulate me from shock, right? Well, that's good. Hey, progress. It ran longer than it ever has while I've owned it. So I'm going to close the valve. I'm going to turn it sideways so that it doesn't, you know, walk its way down towards me here and rip itself off the wall. And uh, then we'll see if it builds pressure. And I need to rig up an air filter for it. I have no idea what happened to the air filter or if it even had one, but I, I don't know now. All right. Well, if this had an air filter, I, I lost it somehow. But I think that'll hold up at least until I turn it on. All right, let's try this again. Wow, that is scary. Okay, so I'm going to uh, fix it because I never fixed the walking back problem. And then I think I'm going to put the scatter shield on there because standing in line with that is kind of, you know, freaking me out a little bit. All right, I really didn't fix either problem. I just turned it sideways. Oh, cool. Why did it do that? Hmm. Well, I guess it's still broken. It's the longest it ran, though. All right, so, learned some new things. Um, one, a uh, bit of a clown. I was sitting here looking at this, doing that same ohm test, and I saw that, and I was like, huh. Well, that's interesting. It's got a capacitor symbol drawn on there. And then, you know... You know, Ape Brain put two and two together that, oh, that symbol's yellow, and there's a yellow button. So I hit the yellow button, and now it reads in farads, which is pretty cool. So if I put it on the, and I I got the capacitors back out of the electric motor because I was double-checking them. And, if, oh, you thing. If at some point I get both of these on here at the same time. So it's supposed to be a 40 farad, uh, plus or minus 6%. So 40.2 is pretty solid. A lot of people were saying, oh, the plastic one is the start one because uh, it's not as durable as one made out of metal. So it's not meant to be run for long periods of time. And... I guess that makes sense because this is supposedly, you know, being made out of metal. It's also uh, supposedly has a oil in it that acts as the whatever electro ion doodad thing in there between the two plates. Okay, so this one's supposed to be like 400 to 480, I think. 400 to 480. Yeah. And it's coming in at 443, so that's solid. So we had two good capacitors in there, and the thing still didn't work. So to look into the issue a little bit further, well, let's look at the original one that I replaced. Again, supposed to be 40 microfarads. And 
that's not a connection issue. It is, this capacitor is dead. There is nothing going on there. So, the ohms test seemed to be kind of a, kind of a hit or miss deal. I mean, definitely it reading only one number. I mean, I have, that seems to be pretty uh, indicative that something is wrong with the capacitor if they, if it does that, just reads a solid number. And then this one goes to counting. There might potentially be hope. So, obviously I took a picture of all this the way it was whenever I took the rear cover off. I mean, because otherwise there's no way to remember how this goes. So, got a picture of it so I can put it back together. And what I have deduced is going on here is this, I believe, to be the thermally, or the thermal switch. The motor also says on the side of it that it's thermally protected. And I believe that's what this guy is. And then here we have the... Uh, this is pretty much the block where power comes in on. And then there's this switch here that kicks uh, on and off the start winding with the centrifugal deal there. Some stuff out that uh, is probably the problem. And I kind of shot myself in the foot with it a little bit. Here's, you know, all the wiring and such. And I figured out that T1 and T2, well, I'm not, I don't know which ones are actually where now, but I figured out that T1 and T2 were one winding and T3 and T4 were another winding. And while I was in here messing with this thing, I uh, peeked around here and saw this little diagram on the side of it. And I thought, oh, well, let me double check and make sure that this is wired right. And I noticed that on that sticker, it had one half that said 115 and the other half said 220. And so what I didn't know until I you know, saw that greasy covered over sticker that says C manual for 220 volt. And seeing the sticker on the side of the motor that had a 115 and a 220 diagram, I figured out that, which I'm, this is probably common knowledge to a lot of people, but I didn't know it, is an electric motor can say that it runs on 110 or 220, but you have to switch wires around in order to do that. So because I stuck my granddad only ever used this thing on 110. At least in his shop, whenever I picked it up, it was it was plugged into a 110 outlet. And then I, thinking that the GFCI outlet was the problem originally, put a 220 plug on it. And so, even after I fixed the capacitor, it's now set up for 110, running 220, and I think that's why the uh, thermal protection switch kept tripping. Maybe, maybe not. I really don't know because running 220 is less amps than running 110, but it certainly wasn't helping the problem. So following that diagram, which on this motor, it was really, really easy. I didn't even, I didn't even need to look back at the YouTube video I found of somebody else doing this, but all the, all the terminals that are connected together are numbered. Like this one's one, this one's three, this one's five, that this one right here is seven. This one is something, can't see it right now. And all the wires are labeled. So there's, there's P2, there's L2, there's T2. And all I did per the diagram is I took uh, this brown wire, which is, uh, what is it? The brown wire is P2. Yeah, so I took P2 from this plug down to plug seven. And then I took uh, T2 from plug three and put it where P2 was here on plug number one, I believe that is. Yeah. Okay, I took my little air filter off because I got an idea for that. But before I get too carried away, uh, I'm gonna see if it works. Got my safety glasses on just in case things get a little crazy. At least my eyes will survive. And got it plugged in. I can't think of anything that I'm forgetting, but if I am forgetting something, I'm sure it'll remind me when I turn it on.
Good enough for me. Drain the air out of it, and then I'm gonna go work on my little air filter deal, and I think it'll be pretty clever, because if this had an air filter on it, I lost it. Hello, Cali. What's up, Scoobs? All right, back out in the shop. Here's the final product of the 3D print. So the big holes are gonna be what bolts it to the, uh, the pump. And it's also going to be what the air filter housing itself bolts to. And then this is the part I'm pretty pleased about. It's got all these little holes in it. And those grab Well, it's kind of hard to see, but they grab all the uh, little prongs in there that go around the edge, and that's just to help keep this thing from twisting. So that fits in there real tight and snug. I mean, there is no wobble or anything in that, and so I'm going to bolt that on. Uh, I'll put some... Originally, I was going to use JB Weld, but I don't even think I need to, so I think I'm just going to put some... Uh, gasket maker around it and put it in there and then the housing will bolt to that no I didn't print it wrong uh, there was a just lapse in the video there for no reason everything's fine uh, so I fixed the metal piece because the metal piece is what's wrong, not my measuring. And uh, I used the right tool the wrong way to get that clearanced a little bit. So that's how that is going to be sitting on there. And so I got to run a drill bit through. I'm going to use the 3D printed piece as a guide and run the drill bit through so I can get my holes here on the back. And then I can bolt it all together and seal it up and it'll be good. All right, so I got it all on there. The adapter's all pretty much pressed all the way into the original air filter housing. These bolts are a little longer than I'd like them to be, but that was, I, I figured the next size down, or the next size down definitely wouldn't have been long enough because a lot of this, you can see where the red starts, that was when it first started engaging pretty much. And from there, it had to pull the 3D printed adapter into this plastic piece because it was a really tight fit. I probably could have gone a little looser on the tolerances. But it seems to be sitting pretty level with the adjustments I made. And these two don't go to anything. They were just more mounting holes for mounting it on the engine that this came off of. Because if I didn't mention this air filter housing and all this came off of a Briggs & Stratton. Uh, just the five horse, flathead Briggs, generic, whatever. From the 80s and 90s and such. And you can see, it goes straight in there. It cleared, the adapter cleared the uh, the nubs there on the inside. Sealed everything up with RTV, even the nuts here on the back and the nuts on there. Everything's got Loctite on it, so it should never vibrate loose. So all that's got to set up, but we can do some testing here without really having to worry about it. And then... This guy, I had to, I need to, I'll go back and clean it up and get all just like the frayed bit off of it. But I had to just go ahead and cut that out a little bit bigger and then cut all the way through it so it can slide on here. Because I don't want to have to be taking this off and resealing it just to take the cover off because that's stupid. Alright, I got it on there. And in the months that this has been apart, I lost the, uh, the bolts that go in there to hold all the shrouding on. 
Uh, so I got frustrated after not being able to find them and drilled them out and put some coarse thread screws in there. Not real proud of that, but it is very much on there and it's all, it's all good now. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't pleased with how this little adapter's worked out. Because again, that's supposed to be on a five horse Briggs and Stratton. And apart from the black plastics not being exactly the same color, I mean, it really doesn't stand out much. I mean, it kind of looks like it was supposed to be there, apart from it being way too big for a compressor of this size. But now I have, and I put a new filter in it, went up to Lowe's and got one of those, so I can just go to the store and get filters for it. Although, realistically, I'll probably never use it enough to actually justify replacing it. But it can be replaced, which is the important part. So, all that's on there. It seems to be pretty good. I'm going to plug it in and let it build up some pressure. I uh, did a little bit of testing on it, and it worked and pressured up. And I'll turn it back on here in a second. But uh, it, was, it got up to about 120, and... It says max pressure of 130, so I'm assuming it's supposed to turn off at 130, but I'm never going to need, I don't, I don't think there's anything I could ever use that actually requires that high of pressure. So just to make it easier on the compressor and just less stress on everything, I dropped the uh, cutoff for the electric motor down. And that's just under the little plastic cover here. I unplugged it. And this just had a, like a gob of some kind of sealant over it, I guess just to show that somebody had calibrated it. And I, I backed it out three turns and that had it shut off at about 100 PSI. And then I put it in uh, one more turn just to see where that uh, shuts it off at. I'd like for it to shut off just a little over 100. So I'm going to put that cover back on, and then I have this hooked up to it, so we can uh, tape that closed and just let it run for a little while and make sure it's going to be all happy. This hasn't fallen off yet, so that's good, but I'm going to put that back on and then we'll let it run for a minute. All right, so it cuts off just over 100, not even 110, so that's good. Uh, regulator leaks, so that'll be, have to be something I fix. So I'm gonna tape that down and then make sure the motor will start on its own just fine and then let it run for a while. Okay, well, just finished draining the tank. It cycled on and off about a half dozen times. Didn't seem to really be getting hot, and the switch was kicking it off just, to, just over 100 PSI regularly, and I didn't look to see when it was kicking it on, but it was kicking it on, so that's pretty much all it needs to do. The regulator quit leaking so bad, so maybe after some more running, it'll quit leaking altogether. But yeah, so I think that is going to be a wrap for this thing it appears to be ready to go back to work so we'll leave this one here ready to go and we'll move on to the next craftsman air compressor because yep there is another one but it is significantly older but it needs to work because again having an air compressor that doesn't work is not really worth having so we'll see about that one